I'm going to talk today about carrageenan spray for the nose um, and how it relates to treatment of viruses. I may have to like clip a lot of this video <laughs> because it is going to be a bit more deeply into science than what I normally would do a video about. And because my son is sick with a virus right now and he wants his mummy. So uh, this is, it's quite controversial, even though he's been ignoring me for an hour as soon as I wanted to start doing a video, he wants his mummy. So his dad is after buying him, but we'll see how well that goes. Okay, so this is um, a carrageenan nasal spray. Um, in the studies, it's referred to as iota carrageenan. This comes from red algae. I've got all these notes as well because I just, I don't want to like mix this up or say the wrong thing. So um, this is com comes from a red algae um, and it's sort of a waxy spray and it's, uh, it's used in cosmetics. It's used in pharmaceuticals and it's used in food. So um, it's relatively considered safe for consumption. Uh, it's, I think it's used in things like ice cream. It kind of gives it um, a bit of a slippery um, texture um, that you see in kind of like more ice milk as opposed to ice cream. So it's a sort of way of making um, ice cream creamy without actually using, um, you know, cream. Um, I'm not sure of all the other uses for it. I have not researched this at all. Uh, I had sort of come across this in a bit of um, an article about the virus and treatment of coronavirus specifically. Now there have been studies in the past with this nasal spray and um, let me just find the viruses it was initially tested on. It was initially tested with influenza, rhinoviruses, and coronaviruses, but not the coronavirus, not COVID-19 kind of virus. Uh, for a few years going back, there's been tests with this. This particular one I bought is sold in just a popular uh, pharmacy here in the UK. You can just buy it on the counter. You can order it online. It's not really considered anything controversial or that requires the pharmacy to intervene. Um, and so there's been sort of building on those initial studies towards whether it could help with the coronavirus. Uh, the first study I looked at more deeply. Now, there's going to be disclaimers. There are going to be caveats. There's going to be lots of that. I'm not a scientist. I'm not trained in science. But I have health anxiety. <laughs> and a lot of people with health anxiety um, tend to go quite deeply into medical studies and to research things. And it can either increase their health anxiety or it can help it. And in my case, it does help because if I understand things better, it's not like this great unknown where I don't, I don't know what causes what or how serious something could be. Uh, some people are just happy to hear from their GP like, don't worry about it, it's fine. Whereas I need to know why it's fine. So I, I do look into things quite deeply. Now, when looking at science research, it's important to think of a few things. And I, this is not an exhaustive list, but the first thing to look at is the source of the information. Um, I would not trust a YouTube video to give me any kind of in-depth information about scientific study. I would not really trust Twitter because it's not gonna go in depth. YouTube is very egalitarian. Anybody can post on YouTube. So 
basically if you want to get in-depth accurate science information i would not look on youtube so that's kind of funny um, but what i'm going to do is point you towards information that you can go look at yourself you can look more deeply into it and, and get a sense of what you can trust and what you can't i just feel like this has been underreported by um further media beyond sort of science media so where would i get good science information i would get it I would, I would maybe read articles about it, about a particular area that I'm interested in. And that could be just from the popular media, but I would not stop there because scientific studies, the studies completed, and then it is submitted to a journal usually. So that is the first thing to look at is, was it you know, submitted to a reputable journal? And often those journal articles are not accessible to the public. So they start as maybe a preprint and then they're published fully. Usually, that's something to look at. Was it, did it stay as a preprint? Was it retracted? And so on. Now, if it is fully published, you're going to be looking at um, can you access the full article or can you not? If you only get a summary, I would not always trust, and this is going to be controversial, but I do not always trust the summary because, because they're repackaging in the summary, or I don't know if repackaging is the right word, but they're packaging it, the results in such a way as to be media ready. They will sometimes simplify and use different language than in the study itself. So. They might sound a bit more certain. They might be using uh, different words, um, like instead of saying good or possibility, it might say, you know, it does and positive and just it, it'll look a bit different. So it might seem, uh, not, I wouldn't say overstating exactly. And they also tend to, and this is actually a pet peeve of mine, They'll often talk about the real world applications and I kind of feel like research into an idea does not always have to at the end give all of the possible ways that that, that science can be applied. So just because something is found to be a result doesn't mean that they have to get particularly specific on the best way that it can be used or who it should be used on if that was not studied specifically in their study. So it seems to me that there could be two separate studies, one of them that shows results and one of them that shows applications going forward because they'll have sort of recommendations sometimes that I don't feel are necessarily supported by the data in the study. But that's common. Now, okay, so we're at that point. You're looking at the, maybe the results. Um, and let's say that's all you can access. Now, what happens is that that might get picked up by the popular media and it might get picked up by science media, but that's sometimes all they'll look at. They don't look any deeper than that or the press release that comes from that. So they might even further simplify it. They might just take some of the language and make it even more specific, or they don't look at whether that language is reflected in the study itself. Now, as it gets sort of watered down and you have one media outlet quoting the previous media outlet, it becomes further simplified, I think. And I understand the importance of that because people like me or other readers wouldn't necessarily understand what they're reading in the study itself. And that's fine. I mean, most of us are not scientists, but it's important to go back as far as you can understand not just look at what the popular, popular, popular media is saying, but to go back as many steps as you can, as many links as you can, as much research as you can understand so that you have the best understanding of that. And I think it's good to have a healthy little bit of skepticism. Now, this is where we run into a problem where there's kind of a distinction between 
scientific skepticism that helps to refine studies, that helps to understand studies, that can build on studies. And there's the kind of skepticism that says, I don't trust any science as it exists. I will only look at alternative media. I will only trust um, these people who have pulled themselves out of the scientific institutions and they're saying, you know, it's all wrong. Because you do get scientists. Scientists are not one kind of thing. They're not this hive mind that all says the same thing. You will get scientists saying different things and believing different things, but you sometimes will get a rogue scientist that says, I don't trust any of the institutions anymore. They're all full of lies. And, and so they'll promote a certain agenda and they'll cherry pick little bits of, of data. And I don't know how that happens or why. Um, I can't speculate on any of that, but you have to be careful that one scientist in one area isn't going to be an expert in every area where they can tell you, you know, about virology and um, immunology and, um, you know, practical a and &E implications and just, they're not going to be an expert in every area. They're not going to know about necessarily bacteria. They're not going to know about sociological implications. They're not going to be an expert in every area. So if you're looking at media just from that one person, like blogs and blogs and blogs or vlogs and vlogs and vlogs or Twitter posts over and over, and they're just commenting on so many different areas, that's a way to be skeptical of that particular person because they're not going to be experts on everything. They're not going to know each of these areas. So it's really, really important to have skepticism about that. <laughs> and also to look at any studies with a critical eye as well as you can yourself. As far, going back again, as far as you can. Um, and if you're interested to look further, do a bit of Googling, see, do other studies say the same thing? Because if it's just one study saying something that is completely different from all the other studies, you're gonna wanna wait until that's backed up by more research. And not just take it at face value. Oh, this one person said that this is great. And then they're just quoted by popular media and other Twitterati or whatever, then that's not to be taken at face value. Um, it's important to use your brain, but use your brain backed by as many scientists as you can, as much research as you can. And often, if it's just one little study and nothing is followed from that, you know, you need to use some common sense in that area. So I'm not a scientist, but these are just things I've thought about science and about trying to interpret it because I've read hundreds, if not thousands of articles, research studies, I've attended conferences, um, just as a lay person to try to expand my mind when it comes to science. So the first little study we're going to look at started as a preprint as they all do, and it became an important study. And this is a meta-analysis. Now a meta-analysis is where researchers try to look at different studies in a certain area, find the ones that are most credible, and look at them together to see what kind of trends you can find, uh, something that might be, if not a conclusion, at least a good direction for future research. Now. That's one of the things to keep in mind when you're reading science is that if there's a lot of certainty in what you're reading, that is a red flag. If they say something is effective or um, definitely does one thing or another, that's a red flag. What you need to look at is things like seems to, appears to, uh, points to, um, um, maybe <laughs> um, you're going to look because science is never quite certain. Studies build on studies, research builds on research, we expand our knowledge. It is an evolving institution all of the time. 
there is no point where we say, well, that's it. That's all we know about a topic. Uh, and that is hard for the lay person because we want certainty, right? We want to know this is the truth. That is not the truth and so on. Okay. That was like more than 10 minutes just talking a little bit about science. I'm sorry to make you sit through that, but that's important to what I'm going to discuss. This was a meta analysis and I'm going to give you the full long title. Carrageenan nasal spray may double the rate of recovery from coronavirus and influenza virus infections. Reanalysis of randomized trial data. And this is Harry Hemla and others at all who have uh, spoken on this. They looked at two trials. They looked at using the nasal spray for three times a day for seven days, follow up for 21 days. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. Um, I'm going to link the study and I'm not sure if that's okay to just link the study, but I'm going to do it anyway in the description. Um, and they found that this nasal spray, this waxy nasal spray, um, increased recovery rate on a kind of average by 54%. That is quite a lot. When you're talking about sort of sciencey things, 54% is quite a lot. Um, it varied by which kind of virus. So it seemed to be most effective in various types of coronaviruses. Again, not the coronavirus. A um, little bit less by influenza and even less by uh, rhinovirus. And that was a specific kind of influenza. Now there's so many subtypes. It didn't seem to work too well in something called adenoviruses, which is too bad because they can be quite severe. Um, so as we know, common cold can be a lot of different viruses. So what they're looking at is flus and common colds, whether it could work. They considered it to be plausible this could help with the coronavirus because these groups would sort of cover similar types of mechanisms. Um, this kind of stuff, um, they only used it for a few days, but they looked at whether it could help beyond that. So that's sort of um, a limitation of that study, although I didn't know if I was going to go too much into the limitations just yet. Um, they thought maybe a longer administration could help to see how much it might help, um, whether different dosages might help. I mean, right now it says on the bottle to use it like twice a day forever or how, however long. Um, but they also think maybe you could look at whether the dosages might help, change in dosages might help or hinder and also whether starting it sooner because they only started it after they had symptoms and so on. Um, this, the authors had no conflict of interest. That is something else to look at. If you have a chance to look even at, um, any kind of summary of, um, if, if all you can access is a little bit of the public facing study, look at conflict of interest. I've gone so far because it matters to me. I've gone so far as to Google some of the researchers to see, do they have some kind of, um, does there seem to be obvious biases because they work for a certain company or because um, they're wanting to advance a certain treatment without having sort of the right kind of background. But anyway, that's, that's more than most people would look into it. But if you have a sociologist telling you that this treatment could work or a psychologist or something, you know, you know, that's not, that's definitely not their area. So, um, okay. So that was that one. Uh, and I think that's all I wanted to say. Oh, they also looked at maybe whether it might help with relapses or reinfections. Um, and they think it could help with that. You know what a relapse is, like where you start to get better and then you get worse again, or maybe you get reinfected, which sounds horrible and it probably is. Um, now, there was a second study, and this is more recent, slightly more recent. And this one actually looked at the coronavirus. Now, the title of this one is Efficacy 
of a nasal spray containing iota carrageenan in the post-exposure prophylaxis of COVID-19 in hospital personnel dedicated to patient care with COVID-19 disease. And this was Figueroa JM, JM Figueroa that, and others at all um, that looked at this. Uh, what they were looking at was basically whether this could help in countries that don't have high vaccination rates. Could this help with the coronavirus? And um, they did find some good results. Now this spray, which I'm not going to recommend that you use because I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist, um, but you may ask your pharmacist or your GP, for example, whether this is right for you and what dosage and so on. And um, there are not too many side effects that are known, but on the insert, there are some listed side effects. So it seems to work this thing by sort of coating the virus. It is sort of a waxy, gloopy stuff. It's sort of mixed in a carrier, but um, it, it seems to coat the virus and it prevents it from maybe adhering or entering the cells of the nose. Um, so that's how they believe it works. See, I'm not speaking with certainty here. Um, so it seems to reduce the cold symptoms in cells and the intensity of the viral loads. I quoted that. Uh, so this was looking not only at whether it makes your symptoms milder or makes your, your um, symptoms end faster but it also looked at, can, you pre can it prevent you from catching the coronavirus? And it looks like the evidence points to the possibility of that being the case. Obviously, there's not tons and tons and tons of research into this yet, but they're, they're saying there, it is possible that it may help. And they had significant results in that as well. Um, there's 79% risk reduction in catching the coronavirus when using this. That's what they found. So these are our significant results. Um, I think, again, you're going to want to do some of your own research and look into things. I have found in real life, I've talked to people about this spray and I have found absolutely nobody <laughs> willing to try it except for me. <laughs> I'm not a salesperson. I'm not getting any kickbacks from this, obviously, because I've not said a brand name. But uh, I decided to try it because I thought there's not a lot of harm in it for me. The side effects for me were not going to be particularly bad. I have gotten a couple of colds that have turned out to be quite mild. I'm the type of person that tends to get secondary infections after a virus. So uh, I tend to get, you know, sinusitis, ear infections, um, bronchitis, you know, strep throat or something like I tend to get more infections after. Um, so, and I haven't had any of that and I've had at least two or three colds since I started using it uh, cause my son brings them home. Uh, but again, what do I know? It's anecdotal. This is not research. I've used it for myself and I found it to be possibly effective. But again, I'm, I'm a case of one. When one person tells you, oh, this worked for me, that is not, that is not a study. That is a person just telling you casually it worked for me. You know, I, I could be telling you that I squirt beer up my nose and that it worked for me. And I mean, that would be, you wouldn't trust that. So don't, definitely don't trust me. I'm just giving you some of the background research that I looked at and um, I would encourage you to do your own research and when I say that I don't mean like be skeptical and, and read some of those sketchy blogs or something or look at you know Facebook and Instagram at what people are saying um, you can follow to the source from what they've said that does not to say everything on these places is not legitimate just try to go back as far as you can understand um, you know and ask your GP um, ask if you have to see like a specialist or something, ask them, ask your consultant about um, what they think of treatments. 
they will likely be quite conservative with what they will recommend because they're going to wait until the science makes its way down to them uh, through regulatory agencies. So um, I'm not going to say this definitely would work or not work for you. Um, and I, I would say don't take my word for it. I am just um, putting some information out there. And I hope you might find it interesting. <laughs>